everybody. Welcome to Paradigm Shifters. Who are Paradigm Shifters? They're people who are taking a chance, being innovative, inventive, and making a difference in our world collective these days. And I have a wonderful Paradigm Shifter. My name is Veronica Entwistle, and I'm introducing a wonderful Paradigm Shifter, Dr. Louisa Williams, who's the author and uh, the one who really knows how to author this, meaning she's also a doctor who works with radical medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Williams. Oh, thanks for having me. I love your book. I have this book in front of me, which is called Radical Medicine, Profound Intervention in a Profoundly Toxic Age by Dr. Louisa Williams. I really recommend this book. It's absolutely stunning how many things you bring together in each conversation. Oh, thanks. Um, and I'm going to go through, basically, I'm going to do it simply. I'm going through the table of contents in a way, just a little bit, because it, it struck me in this book that you were talking about the complicated undercurrents that come together in our health and in our healing. Would you explain your book that way? Is that how you see it? Yes. I mean, in, in some ways it's almost 1,200 pages, so it did get quite complex. <laughs> but in other ways it's, it's really simple. And, and the reason I wrote the book is because I wrote it for people that have become frustrated eating a good diet, good, you know, getting enough sleep, exercising, and still you know, not enjoying optimal health, still having mild symptoms, sometimes major symptoms, sometimes chronic disease. So I, I wrote it um, to uh, help people understand that you have to go further than, than just a clean diet nowadays. It's not enough in this toxic world. Mm. And there's no way to get away from toxicity, is there? Well, a lot of us uh, know, I mean, because it's in the air and the water and just the stress of the environment nowadays, and you can't even move to the country anymore, right, because that's more toxic than ever with the pesticides. With the pesticides and so on. I love the first chapter, European Drainage Remedies and Miasms. I thought that was pretty interesting, and um, it, it really reminded me that, first of all, we're born with a whole bunch of stuff going on. It's like, it's like little kids were supposed to be... Uh, Little babies are supposed to be empty of any problems, and it's not so. They come in with a whole bunch of cellular stuff. And in your writing here, I understand how we come in with what you're calling miasms or influences that are part of our lineage, right, or part of our culture. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, miasm is a, is a homeopathic term, which uh, means an inherited weakness uh, uh, or tendency one has. So some people tend towards getting headaches. Other people tend towards getting cancer. Other people tend towards... Uh, joint problems, people have different tendencies when they're under stress, when their system weakens. And I use the four primary miasms in the first chapter because we use those a lot as a roadmap uh, for patients in our practice it, to show them how they're getting well or not getting well, you know, what we're missing when they're not improving as they should. So do you start off with a homeopathic constitutional? Well, uh, European drainage remedies actually are also herbal remedies. Hmm. And I use more of the herbal remedies in this chapter. I talk more about constitutional homeopathy in Chapter 5, which is also a major foundation in my, in my practice. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you remembered, but I mentioned the Sankaran system from India. And Dr. Sankaran, who's been studying forever, he's a homeopath in Mumbai, India. He's been studying forever uh, homeopathy, and he was just as frustrated as the rest of us in that these little remedies that are plant, animal, or mineral remedies, often, you know, you'd only get like one patient well out of 100. They weren't, you know, they, it, the system just wasn't working as well. And in 2003, Sankaran's system came together, and a lot of us that realized the miracle he had done have been studying our heads off ever since uh, to learn his system. So now we have a really good percentage of accuracy finding the patient's single remedy to help clear that miasm in their life, emotionally, mentally, and physically. So you're saying the way we've understood it so far is there's so many, um, like, hidden complications that till you get to a really root energy block like that, it's pretty hard to get a total clearing. Is that right? Yeah, well, Dr. Hahnemann, Hahnemann, Samuel Hahnemann, discovered homeopathy in Europe or originated it in the 1700s and 1800s, and it's a fantastic thing, this energy medicine that you can take a, a little sugar pill that has the energy of a plant or an animal or a mineral substance, and that energy can resonate with the distortion pattern in our energy field and like two glasses uh, or a glass that breaks under a particular, you know, opera singer's note, that'll sh begin to shatter that chronic distortion pattern we're holding. I mean, it sounds, sounds kind of bizarre, but we are possessed. <laughs> we 
<laughs> we are really possessed at some point in our lives or our past life. We take on the energy of a plant, an animal, or a mineral. In other words, somebody may act aggressively like a lion or somebody may be you know, flat like a rock and, and, and you know, have depression or, or somebody may have chronic vulnerability and sensitivity like a plant. Hmm. It's just bizarre, and it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. But since Sankaran has fine-tuned Dr. Hahnemann's system from the 1700s, uh, we're getting fantastic success now. Well, and you said since 2003? Since 2003, his system came together in a teachable manner. Hmm. And those of us that had gone to naturopathic college where they teach, you know, homeopathy, and had gotten a bit frustrated because it didn't work as well as it should, just went eureka, you know, the Sankaran system, he, he has done it. So. so what did he discover that brought it together? It, it sounds boring. He simply figured out the interview style hmm. to discern exactly the right remedy. Hmm. So, so one thing in the 90s, he started realizing these, these remedies can be, be divided up into plant, animals, and minerals, hmm. different categories, and through that you can figure out more, okay, which kingdom is this patient speaking from? And also, similar to modern-day um, uh, psychology techniques uh, like Peter Levine and somato-emotional techniques, where people are getting hit more and more to the realization that it's the deep sensation level that one has to reach to help heal psychological wounds. Mm -hmm. The same thing with homeopathy, that we, when we're interviewing a patient according to the Sankaran system, we, we need to reach the deep sensation level that this patient is feeling, hmm. the distortion pattern is. If we stay at the mental plane, if we stay with the emotions, we will not get the right remedy. Well, that makes incredible sense, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, well, that's why I was hit to it, because I love psycho-spiritual work. And well, you studied psychology, did you not? I did, and I was doing psychology before I, I got into chiropractic and naturopathic. And I'm in the Ridwan um, Diamond Heart Approach School, which is very much, you know, a part of what we do is, um, is um, breath work and, and getting into the, the deep inquiry, into the deep levels of distortion that uh, we may be, you know, still be harboring from our childhood. Hmm. So you really got quite a, a, comp, a, a let's see, well-rounded approach to your clients, don't you? Well, yeah, I was in school forever. <laughs> <laughs> you must have loved it. I don't know what I was doing, you know, probably working on my ego deficiency. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I love, I, I really, you know, I think when you just need to go after the truth over the years, you just, you know, after a while, you just, uh, things hold up, the things that hold up that are important hold up and, and you get a lot more success and a lot more satisfaction in your practice because you're really finding more curative treatment for patients and not just, you know, you know, getting people a little bit better, which happens, you know, when you're first in practice before you're really, you know, more skilled at it. Well, you have to kind of keep being more and more skilled at your own to really make a difference, I believe. You do. You do. I want to jump to um, foci, foci, I don't know how to say it, foci, foci. Well, either or dominant foci, or yeah, is is normally how people say it. But all right, so we've already talked a little bit about the homeopathic thing, and I love your um, discovery through the interviewing process because that's what I, I believe so much. Is the deeper we go, the deeper we go, the deeper we go, the more we can undo, unravel the pu puzzle. Yeah. But then we're getting more into the physical. I believe this is more into the physical. Some of the blocks to healing can be scars, or it's F O C I, which I guess is foci. You're like a dental focus or a tonsil focus, and this is my chapter four, which is 250 pages and probably the most unique part of my book because most holistic doctors and practitioners haven't heard much about foci, and nor are they able to diagnose it and treat it. So foci are chronic areas in the body that are quite insidious because they're usually silent, hmm. like a disturbed or inflamed tooth or abscessed tooth or root canal tooth. Like a, like a tonsil focus where you had a lot of fo uh, tonsillitis when you were young, but then you had so many antibiotics that, you know, after a while you no longer have tonsillitis very often, but you have other symptoms. And who knows where else it went. <laughs> yes, where did it go? Deeper, actually. So, yeah. Or those of us who automatically had tonsillectomies as children. Right. Or appendectomies. You're talking about those as a focus place as well. Yes, because the scars can create a neurological interference in the body all the time. And it's just like a little scratch, you know, in your body 24 hours a day, a little disturbing symptom that is, is, is not really available to consciousness but um, can create quite a problem because uh, chronic irritation can lead to chronic inflammation and then to infection and, uh, and then, you know, more serious problems. So. Is it just that it blocks? Oh, here's an example. I know a young woman, a wonderful young woman who's now almost 40, and she had a pituitary removed when she was 10. Wow. And she now has a scar across her skull to send the hairline. 
uh-huh. which had 50 stitches in it. So it's a rather immense scar. That's, and that's, she, that's definitely a scar interference feel, as the Germans call it. And also uh, the other big problem is that where the pituitary was, there's a kind of a cave. Yes, the cella tersica. Yeah, so what would you say to her? How can a person deal, when we know it's there, how can we support our health and deal with it? And let's use her case, for example. Right. Well, scar interference fields can be treated two ways. One, you can treat them in a way called, uh, well, several ways. One way is neural therapy without needles. Neural therapy is a uh, technique developed by two German brothers, the Hunicke brothers, in the early 1900s. Uh, in Germany and in other places, they inject scars with local anesthetics, and what that anesthetic does is it temporarily calms down the area, allows the cells and the, and, and the tissues in the area to become more healthy, and after the anesthesia has worn off in two to three hours, uh, you have a more healthier tissue that's functioning better. Now, I used to inject and teach neural therapy in Europe and America, but I stopped after uh, Scientific America came out in the early 1900s, I mean, 1990s, with the fact that lidocaine is carcinogenic. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, all local anesthetics break down to toxic aniline, and aniline is a carcinogenic compound that the liver and kidneys must excrete in the body. Hmm. So um, even procaine, any kind of any kind of anesthesia is toxic. In fact, uh, a famous uh, uh, dentist in holistic circles, Dr. Nickel, who lives in the Bay Area, he believes that the reason there's so much breast cancer and cancer in Marin County and other places um, where there's a lot of wealth, uh, wealthy population is because there is so much uh, surgery and dental visits and so much anesthesia being injected, and anesthesia is carcinogenic. Now, if you have one surgery in 10 years, you can handle it, but if you, you, know, if you, if you get a lot of anesthesia, it's a problem. So over time, I, I just couldn't do neural therapy anymore because of the carcinogenicity of the anesthetic. It was too disturbing. But you can also treat scars uh, without needles, and you can rub essential oils on or homeopathics on, and you can laser that in with a laser in the office. So you can um, treat them without laser, and then another way to treat them is uh, auriculotherapy from France, where you put needles in the ear to respond to that particular scar, hmm. like acupuncture. But are you saying that actually long-term scars are at some level still irritable, irrit- even if you don't recognize that they are? Yes. I mean, most of the time they're asymptomatic. You would never. They don't itch. They don't. They don't bother you. But major scars, and even sometimes minor scars can be chronic, silent, irritating thorns in your body. And what's interesting about chronic foci, whether it's a tooth, a tonsil, or a scar, is that they, they cause disturbed fields that are symptomatic. Hmm. So in other words, um, for example, if I have uh, chronic right sciatica and right leg pain and I have an appendix scar, you know, I may go to an allopathic medical doctor and he'll give me anti-inflammatories for my leg pain and my low back pain on the right side, mm-hmm. but it's really secondary uh, in, a, in a large way to my appendix scar. Mm-hmm. So once again, the allopath or the doctor that doesn't understand what a focus is is treating the symptom and not, not treating the cause. Same thing with, for example, say I have chronic sinusitis and maybe it's worse on the left side all the time. Well, a holistic doctor that understood foci and focal infections would examine the teeth and see if I have problems in the teeth, especially on the left side. Same with breast cancer. The first thing you want to ask a patient with breast cancer is, uh, you know, which, which breast is it and do you have any problems on that same side uh, dentally? And a German dentist wouldn't hesitate to be rather aggressive and pull any um, abscess teeth on the same side of that breast cancer right away. Hmm, how interesting. Yeah. But we don't do that in this country, huh? Well, there are there are holistic dentists in this country that recognize that, and uh, of course they're you know vilified and harassed by their allopathic you know <laughs> conventional right. colleagues. But we do have um, holistic dentists that are aware of it, but they're in the minority. Hmm. Well, Dr. Williams, it sounds to me like people who are listening have the ability to do something to offset the the uh, trauma of their scars. Just listening to this, I'm going, well, we could probably muscle test uh, what you call uh, the essential oils, for example. We could right. probably find yeah. something suitable for ourselves. You can do that with appendix scars, episiotomy scars, uh, traumatic scars. You can do home neural therapy without needles, rubbing in oils. Uh, sometimes oils are a bit strong. Uh, you can also use shea butter. They have some good shea butter at Whole Foods now. That's a good uh, cream to rub into these oils. And usually the protocol is every day for two to three weeks to mitigate the irritation of that scar. Hmm. So the, this is something that we could all do. Yeah, yeah, at home. Now, I will say if somebody's in compromised health, I would see a holistic doctor who's aware of foci before I started that. I have seen people react, especially when you're getting into the essential oil 
territory rubbing it into a particular scar because that is strong. And your you know, book, but your book has some of this advice in it, doesn't it? Right. I think I suggest, though, um, isopathic drops from uh, Mike Sheehan at, in Bi at Bio Resource in Santa Rosa. Um, those are homeopathic drops at 3x and 4x uh, to rub into the area. And uh, but I think I, again, I do warn people: if you're in compromised health, you'd want to go to a holistic doctor because what a holistic doctor can do, as well as one who does energetic testing is unpeel the onion in a more proper manner. You know, uh, sometimes it's not good to jump right into the focus. Maybe you need to, you know, if you're strong enough, get your amalgam fillings out first. Maybe you need to avoid your food allergy first. You know, there's different layers of when the body's ready to respond. So because all of these the scars and the fillings and so on are working as a symphony, aren't they? They are. They are. But yes, that is something that people in average health can do at home. Is is I would I would suggest possibly uh, I think would be better is the shea butter mm -hmm. and get some good good organic shea butter at Whole Foods, rub it into the scar area, keep it in the bathroom because it's especially good um, on skin that's warm and, and soft and, uh, you know, after a bath or a shower. And do that once a day, twice a day for two to three weeks and see if, you know, some of your symptoms don't resolve with that. So that's wonderful advice. Have you got anything to say about uh, people who have fillings and maybe can't afford to go do it all at once? What can we do to offset some? Well, yeah, first of all, nobody should do it all at once because it's a stress. Even the healthiest person shouldn't get all their fillings out at once if, if they have four quadrants of mercury amalgam fillings. Mercury amalgam fillings are the worst thing that ever happened to our generation. You know, they, they became quite popular after World War II, after a whole bunch of dentists who were trained in the military to, to throw in that very easy to uh, – to, uh, throw in uh, mercury amalgam into a tooth, and um, it's also very cheap, so it became the vogue in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Even now, dentists are still using mercury amalgam. Uh, so it's, it was a horrible thing to do to put the second most toxic uh, metal on the, on the earth, uh, you know, in our mouths. It was outrageous, and it still is. And so if people are strong enough uh, they need to go to a holistic dentist and start getting those mercury amalgams placed. A person of average health would get one uh, one quadrant out a month. And um, also, at the same time, you need to make sure you're taking good quality products to help uh, detoxify. How do you detoxify mercury? Is it done some of these... Uh we have a far infrared sauna. That's helpful, isn't it? Far infrared saunas are very good. They actually are very good. They're excellent at, at detoxifying. Also, you know, good vitamins, vitamin C, uh, algaes, sea algaes, alginates are very good of, 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 of binding on to the mercury and to other, the other heavy metals and getting them out through the gut. One of the most important things to realize is that most of the toxic metals come out through the intestine, not the kidneys and the bladder. In fact, 80% comes out. They did a study in Sweden, and they found that uh, the day of and four days after the mercury amalgam is removed is when most of the mercury is coming out of the system. Mm. So I always tell patients, do not get constipated. Be sure that you really have good bowel movements every day, and if you're having trouble, do, a, do an enema or get a clonic. And mm. patients that are not feeling well after mercury removal, if they get a clonic, it's, it's often night and day. Mm. This, is, this is a time when clonics are really, uh, really important, very That's helpful. Crucial. What yeah. about a bulking agent or a bentonite or so on? Exactly. All that is very good because otherwise you're just going to reuptake the toxic metals if you don't excrete it out well enough. Mm. So, it, you know, you want to find a holistic dentist. You want to find a holistic doctor if you can in your area to help uh, get you on, the, on good products, drainage remedies, detoxification remedies, so that you really, you know, get your money's worth and you get that mercury out as much as you can when you are uh, replacing the fillings. Oh, Interesting. Um, jumping around, I just want to ask you so many different questions. Uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about drainage. I also would like to talk about hormones and hormone replacement. So, uh, well, um, drainage is chapter one, and they say you know first you have to open the door, and then you know before you push the toxins out. So, drainage is a broad umbrella term that refers to any time the body is excreting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you have uh, drainage through massage, you have drainage through the far infrared sauna and steam, through sweating. Uh, natural drainage in that way, and drainage in Europe refers to the use of either complex home homeopathy, combination homeopathic products, or herbal remedies uh, that help the body's uh, emunctories, the, the drainage organs like the kidneys and the liver and the intestine, uh, it helps stimulate them so the body can drain in its own way, mm -hmm. so, you're, you know, so you're doing it in a really holistic manner. Now. M when I wrote the book, of course, after I finished the book last year, mm -hmm. I like another drainage remedy now. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I use uh, Unda in Belgium, 
and Sir Royal distributes that in America, and that's what I talk about in Chapter 1. And they're a good company, but since then I've, there's another company in America that's better, and that's Gemo Base USA. And um, that is also coming from an herbal company in Belgium, grows their herbs organically, and picks them according to Rudolf Steiner methods, in other words, in the, at the exact time of day when the Saturn and Pluto and all the planets are in the right configuration. I mean, the Europeans just have it all over on us in regard to how incredible they are at farming and, you know, very precise, uh, you know, agriculture. So anyway, this, this other company, Gemmo Base USA, has got that G-E-M-M-O? Yeah, Gemmo Base, G E M M O B A S E U S A. I think it's dot com. Mm -hmm. So because I don't take money from any of these companies, I can change as I want to. And I, I like this company a lot better. For one thing, they're not dil diluted like Unda, so they have they're small bottles of concentrated herbs, and uh, they're incredibly powerful. I mean, compared to the old company, you took fifty to seventy five drops a day. This new company, you take one to three drops a day. And these are tinctures. These are alcohol and glycerin tinctures. And what Gemmo therapy means? Gemmo means bud. And drainage came from um, Dr. Paul Henri in Belgium in the mid-1900s. And what he discovered is that um, instead of using the adult mature plant for an, for an herbal remedy, which is already, you know, um, completely absorbed carbon dioxide and toxic lead and all kinds of pollution in the air, why not use a young bud or a young rootlet or a young shoot of a brand new plant that has all this growth hormone in it and all these antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and all these, all these young constituents. It's just bursting with energy and life. And um, so that's what the gemotherapy is, is it's um, alcohol tinctures of herbs from the young, young shoots or buds that have incredible energy. It's hmm. amazing. Hmm. And they're incredibly curative. Hmm. And they're done here in America. No, they come from Belgium. But they come from Belgium, but we, we get them in America now, so it's fantastic. So I, this so can they be used to help with scars, you know what I'm saying, or to help with the teeth? You can put them on uh, physically. Uh, you know, you can rub them on topically. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly they're oral, but, yeah, and, and, you know, there's like 40 or 50 of these herbs they have right now, so they work on all different parts of the body, mm -hmm. and, and they're just incredibly, you know, anti-cancer, antioxidants, helping regenerate tissue, restoring, um, you know, degenerated organs. They're just amazing. And in conjunction with the constitutional homeopathy, they, those two are really two of my heavy hitters in, in really supporting the patient to get well. Hmm. And you actually see results in patients, do you? Oh, yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, you know, I think when I first started out in practice, you know, at first year, you don't know that much. You don't know which companies are the good ones or not. And after a while, you get, you know, you develop a really good BS detector. <laughs> you know, you only carry the things that work. And after a while, when you've been in practice, uh, you actually have to be careful with your dosage because the products you carry are so strong and effective. So. You know, that's, that's kind of the good news. <laughs> so it's cheaper for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's get into a wildly political thing right now, which is called hormones. Yes, yeah, I, you're right, uh, Veronica. I don't uh, talk about, um, you know, estrogen replacement therapy or hormone replacement therapy very much in my book. I don't like to go that route. I will use progesterone cream sometimes for menstrual cramps. I'll use it for infertility. Um, and sometimes for hot flashes, but on the whole, even the plant substances that are used uh, as um, replacement estrogen and progesterone, to me, is not the direction you want to go. I mean, I try to be holistic and as clean and as natural as possible. What I want to do is help restore the adrenal glands and restore the organs and the liver to function well enough so the body can create its own natural hormones, no matter what age we are. You know, these natural har these hormones... Uh, hormone replacement wasn't around years ago. You know, people didn't use these. So um, I, I don't practice hormone replacement therapy. I, I don't particularly like it. So your feeling is that if we are, if we go through menopause, then that's the natural cycle? Is that? It's a natural cycle, and you can, if you have hot flashes, that's a toxic liver. If you are um, you know, have dryness and other problems sexually, then you need to work on your adrenal glands to get your adrenals functioning so they can, they can uh, secrete more estrogen, uh, you know, themselves naturally. I mean, there's, there's so many things you can do without resorting to a replacement-type program, which is like a substitute program, but it's not really treating the cause of the patient's problem. And I, I know think that's the first time I've ever heard anybody say that there's so many things you can do. Yes, and that's there's and you know people say, well, you know, we're using natural wild yam and we're using et cetera, you know, this, but actually by the time they put it together, they're using it in a medic medication type 
manner and not really treating the, the cause of the problem, which is usually toxic congested liver, too many toxic chemicals in our makeup and cosmetics that are, you know, you know, uh, creating uh, problems in the in the hormonal system and acting as estrogens and confusing the system. Now somebody just told me today that what's really interesting is a hot flash is actually an anti-cancer thing. Oh. Because huh. he said, and well, you're saying it a different way. He said it, it burns out something toxic. Oh, that's an interesting thing. I've never heard of that. I hadn't either, but I, it's certainly a food for thought and food it for is. appreciation, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, so what about my friend who has no pituitary and has, of course, all kinds of hormonal support just to keep her alive, really? Well, I would think... Now, that's, that's a good point. So um, in those cases, I would think about these drainage remedies I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Our herbs, I sound like I'm contradicting myself now, but like chase tree has, is an herb that's like a natural progesterone. In her case, she may need to take those herbs. Mm -hmm. But what I meant was um, to help support, you know, the, the natural release of hormones in her body uh, mm -hmm. through the adrenals, through the ovaries, through the, the organs that are functioning that she has left. What I meant was when people package these herbs and put them in a, in a very strong concentration and, and, you know, give you hormone replacement. Oh, I understood what you meant, actually, yeah. but, you know, carrying it a little farther is using something natural for someone who's not able to do that. Right, but, but I know. still think, you know, these, these plants and herbs can do so much. It's amazing. I, I would really suggest the drainage remedies. In fact, these drainage gemotherapy remedies the more research you look into it and the huge amount of constituents they have, vitamins, minerals, hormonal constituents, amino acids, um, uh, again, anti-inflammatories, antioxidants, et cetera, uh, they have so much in, in there for us that they, they are a medicine cabinet, you mm -hmm. know, and they can do so much without the harmful effects of, of suppressive drugs. Suppressive, you know, suppressing something is the worst thing we can do, and as we know, allopathic medicine is unfortunately the third leading cause of death in america and probably the first leading cause of death Wow, oh, that's amazing isn't it? that comes from the journal of america of the american medical association in two thousand where it was found to be the third leading cause of death so suppressing um, symptoms is is psychologically the worst thing we can do and physically the worst thing we can do hmm. well that then that brings us to aging because there's quite a, a tragic reality for pharmaceuticals and aging these days isn't there there's so much polypharmacy it is criminal it is criminal so many, you know, people over, you know, 50 or 60 are on, you know, so many medications and medications to treat the side effects of, of other medications, and it's, it's laughable if it's, you know, if, if it wasn't so tragic. Well, I think huge, uh, uh, a huge number of people are suffering from uh, a limited life as a result, and I just wish there was some way of discussing that, you know. Well, it's amazing. It's not on the front page of the newspaper, but we know why it's not. You know, well, but if the baby boomers are coming in with a big boom, well, it might well be, huh? I hope so, because it's it's unbelievable that it's the drugs that are causing the problems. But the pharmaceutical companies have such a stranglehold on everyone that, you know, it's just it's hard to uh, get that information disseminated. It's just like autism now, you know. I mean, I love Brian Williams and the 6 o'clock news, and I just want to put my foot through the TV when I hear them say, oh, they're finding now that, that, that autism is not correlated at all to vaccines. <laughs> That's a lie. Who found it? Yeah, I know. That is a lie. Yeah, well, uh, David Kirby, who wrote an excellent book on autism called Evidence of Harm, mm -hmm. who showed the direct relationship of thimerosal, the mercury-containing preservative in vaccines, and the onset of autism, uh, spoke to us at our holistic dental seminar last year and showed how they had diluted the, stati the statistics and put children of different ages, younger and older than the typical onset of uh, autism occurs at age one or two, mm -hmm. Uh, they put uh, they put a larger uh, population of children in and diluted the statistics, and that's why you're hearing that on the news now. Hmm. They're coming from that research, and what they did is they just tampered with the research statistics. Hmm. Like the election definitely <laughs> to autism, definitely. Wow, that's amazing. It's it's well, I want to talk about brain chemistry as well. Yeah, um, the fact that I, um, which does relate to autism, the fact that I was so excited when I read in your book about the. Uh, the intestinal tract and the link to creating serotonin and so on. And I'm a big one for looking into what's going on in the brain and follow the edge effect and things like that. But this is much deeper, much more profound. Right. Well, I was quoting Michael Gershon in his book, The Second Brain. And he talks about the fact that 95% of serotonin is made in the gut and is stored in the gut. And then, as needed, goes to the brain and, and other areas of the nervous system to act as a neurotransmitter. And that's true with all of the neurotransmitters, that they're actually synthesized in the gut. All of them, even the um, other, other lobes of the brain and the, 
all of them are made in the gut and then utilized in the brain and other parts of the nervous system. So, you know, our feel good and mood relaxer serotonin, you know, instead of giving Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil, what they need to be looking at is how many times has that child or adult been subject to, subjected to antibiotics, which destroys the flora in the gut and the functioning in the gut and the immune system in the gut. So the antibiotics, the sugar, the diet, all of those are creating you know, havoc in our well-being a lot because of these neurotransmitters are not being produced and stored correctly. I think that's wonderful information, actually, because there's so much about um, having a good and thorough bowel movement and cleansing, the, you know, all of that. That's yeah. so relevant, isn't it? Yes, and, you know, holistic doctors have said it forever, right? All holistic practitioners have said it's in the gut. <laughs> in my book, again, that's why I wrote the book, is I'm saying, yes, diet is essential. A good diet is absolutely essential, but we have to attend to other things. If you have a mouthful of mercury fillings, if you use, you know, uh, conventional makeup, you buy it at, at department stores full of toxic chemicals, you know, um, all these other things you have to attend to. You can't just, uh, you know, eat a good diet like uh, Andrew Weil and a lot of well-meaning doctors say. It's a lot more than that nowadays because we've all been so damaged from 20th century medicine. And where do we get the diet as well? Somebody right. was telling me as well that you clear the mercury from your fillings, but you also have these great downloads of mercury coming through our polluted atmosphere. So you're never actually going to get rid of it. No, but the amount in the filling is so outrageous and so directly implanted in our body that by far that's a worse assault in our system than even the fish, mm -hmm. which has been, you know, has definitely been polluted with mercury. But nothing has come close to the, to the uh, you know, travesty of mercury amalgam fillings. There's a great website that everybody can go to if you just Google smoking tooth. Smoking, smoking tooth. tooth. You'll go to the IAOMT website. You'll see a nice little short uh, documentary there on a 35-year-old mercury filling still off-gassing after all this time, continuing to intoxicate the tissues and the brain. The main target organ of mercury is uh, the neurology, the nerves, mm -hmm. so it affects our brain primarily. Well, you know, I always believe that there are these, like, flows of illness that run through the collective at any given time. Yeah. And we've had so much about Alzheimer's. Do you think there's a link there? What do you think that? Oh, no, no, no. I don't think anything. That has been incontrovertibly correlated um, two mercury amalgam fillings. That, that's mercury and Alzheimer's. That's a done deal. That what, is about, already, what about aluminum and, and Alzheimer's? Uh, not quite as much. Definitely aluminum is a factor, but Dr. Boyd Haley, uh, who is a fantastic researcher, has directly correlated. The scientific evidence is in. Mercury is definitely the number one cause of Alzheimer's. And you have, have all the boomers getting older. Well, when did mercury fillings come into being? In the 30s and the 40s and the 50s when we were all you know, now that we're all aging, uh, we're the ones that were the most damaged from the mercury amalgam. Is and the Alzheimer's growing amongst the baby boomers? Oh, yeah. Alzheimer's has been growing precipitously the past few decades. I thought it decades. was maybe calming down. Maybe that's just in my own subjective reality. No, it's, uh, no, it's getting worse and worse. It's not uh, being cured in any way. Well, what about not glyconutrients? What do you think of glyconutrients? Because I heard this. I, this is hearsay. I have no actual evidence, although I think I could track a little bit of it, that using, um, for example, Ambrotose, um, has increased the person, a person with uh, very severe Alzheimer's that hasn't spoken for five years, their brain capacity increased radically after taking that for a while. You know, I haven't used that in ages ago. I remember there was a, kind of a multi-level company in Dallas that was selling that, and I stopped using it ages ago, and I, I'll just have to pick it up again and try it again. I, I don't know. I, I have heard good things about it. but Well, you know, I'm an experimenter with all this stuff, and on my own brain, I did not know I had ADD. I thought it was because I was a psychic, and my brain was a little weird. <laughs> but after taking um, Ambrotose for two months and then going off it, I noticed my brain going back to an anxiety I'd always had but thought it was my brain. And so I, I'm on it every day, even though it's a multi-level and I can scoff at that. Uh huh. I think it's the glyconutrient thing. Maybe it's the aloe vera base. I right. Know, I haven't gone right. farther into it. But I thought you might know something about it. But I also wondered if it had some ability to offset mercury because of the fact it brought some Alzheimer's people back into function. I don't know. I mean, aloe is an incredible nutrient. Uh, it's got a lot of vitamin C and antioxidants in it in, it, in and of itself. So I don't know. I'll have to pick that up again. I, I haven't used it in years, but I, you're the second person lately I've heard talk about it, so I must mean... Well, if you're anything like me, you get to the third person and you do it, whatever it is. I know. I should look into it again. <laughs> now, there's a thing. You've written about psycho-spiritual healing, and I have to say that in my work, my guides tell people that, and I just said this on the earlier show, 95% of our job of evolution is clearing. <laughs> which you're talking about drainage, I'm going, it's very similar. Yeah. And, yeah. I do energy and so on. But I thought you might want to talk a little bit about the psycho-spiritual, since that's another of your fields. 
Right. Well, I had to include that because, um, you know, it's when important. I, that's why. So important. And I just congratulate a patient, you know, when we're detoxing and doing all this physical work and then emotions start coming up. I always think it's a fantastic evolution and, and try to take the opportunity to refer them to a, a very quality, you know, psychological or psycho spiritual transpersonal psychology type type uh, person, and, and I, I talked about transpersonal psychology, and uh, my particular group is, is the Ridwan School uh, that uses the diamond approach, and basically that is um, inquiry into one's particular, any particular block or uh, emotional issue um, to get to the truth. I mean, it's just to get to the truth, and the teacher is Hamid Ali. He is not a guru. He's just a very good teacher, and um, he, the school's been around forever. And It's called Diamond Heart? Yeah, it's called the Diamond Heart Approach, and it's Ridwan School, um, R-I-D-H-W-A-N. Hamid Ali is a Kuwaiti man that came over to California in the, in the 60s and uh, studied the Enneagram and, you know, studied all kinds of, you know, transpersonal psychology that was going on at the time. And he just has the unique ability to sift through information amazingly and 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 come out with, with the truth. What what you know, feels real for him and, and what has stood up, stood out as, uh, uh, over time as incredible teaching. He, um, let's see, I think there's a book called The Diamond Approach, and he's written some books called Diamond Heart Book One. That's a good introduction. But it includes breath work. It includes understanding about the Enneagram. It includes so much. And it, we, we also spend a lot of time working on our own superego, uh, inquiring into our own internal critic that is so debilitating to our system and and to help reduce that egoic tendency and you know become more and more free and, and more able to express our true selves is the goal of the school so and where is the school well it's uh, located in Berkeley but it's throughout the world I think uh, if you just go to um, um, ridwan.org or, or just Google Diamond Heart you'll see all about the schools all over and uh, you know, there are different groups and we get together and have retreats once a year twice a year and then there's ongoing groups throughout the world, and it's it's just an incredible school. I, Hamid Ali has had the chance to become commercial and get really popular at different times in his life, and he's never chosen to. Well, he's always him. chosen to just keep studying and keep doing incredible work with high integrity. Excellent. Now, I want to jump in before I lose you. <laughs> um, I want to mention your book again. It's Radical Medicine, and it's a wonderful, wonderful compendium of all kinds of approaches that well, actually made me feel more powerful, even though I didn't do them all yet. <laughs> But um, uh, I wanted to ask you about ADD and ADHD and what you have to say about that in our planet right now. And I don't know if we're going to have time for the next question. Okay. Well, um, one thing, another thing people may not know is ADD and ADHD have a lot to do with the tonsil focus. Going back to Chapter 4, there's a new syndrome called PANDAS that two female physicians named. It's called, it's, uh, it stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neurological Dysfunction Associated with Streptococcus. And what they found, what they observed, is that children, after having a streptococcal infection, a sore throat, or flu, often, uh, not often, but sometimes afterwards, would become quite compulsive, either uh, obsessive thoughts or washing their hands or checking the stove several times, all these kind of compulsive tendencies, even coming out with ticks and Tourette's and, and you know, in, in ADD-type tendencies all along that, that kind of spectrum. So that's a little-known um, etiology of some of these learning uh, disabled and obsessive compulsive tendencies and, and some of these disorganizing tendencies with that are part of ADD and hyperactivity. Um, so the one thing to, to ask about is, has the patient had a lot or a significant bout of tonsillitis and sore throats? Were they treated with suppressive antibiotics? If they were, to consider that the, fa that the fact is that the patient may have a tonsil focus, and tonsil foci are treated by avoiding your primary food allergy, uh, uh, treating the tonsil areas uh, themselves, uh, getting on uh, a really clean diet, and, um, How do you treat the tonsil areas? It's pretty hard to rub something into them, isn't it? Well, actually, you can rub uh, homeopathic drops over the area of those lymphatic tissues in the front of the throat. Mm -hmm. Again, we used to inject into the tonsils, but until somebody comes out with a clean anesthetic, I don't do that as much anymore. But you can treat the tonsils specifically uh, with essential oils right over the throat. That's a way of treating it. You can gargle. Um, Food allergies, makes sense. dairy allergies are very common for a tonsil focus. Uh, again, constitutional homeopathy, drainage remedies help a lot to help, you know, heal those tonsils. But well, what about acupuncture? 
Acupuncture too. Acupuncture can be really helpful too. Well, that is an anesthetic, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one aspect of ADD and ADHD. Another thing is just the toxic foods. You know, the foods are just are terrible, and a lot of uh, mothers and, and parents with children with ADD, ADHD, or any any children along that autism, autistic spectrum are avoiding dairy and wheat. Dairy and wheat are the two major food allergies, the two. And they used to be the mainstays of our diet, didn't they? I know. We overate them, and our parents overate them, and, you know, and, and they're only growing one or two types of wheat now, so we're not getting the variety, and our immune system is just getting overly sensitized. To Do you think that the tonsil fossi would be also responsible for autism at all? Uh, I think that is, is definitely more related. I mean, I think there's a part of that, but I, I think that the biggest culprit of that is the thimerosal mercury and the vaccines. So actually these are really reflective of our times, these diseases. It is reflective. The Amish population does not have autism. They don't get vaccinated. Hmm. You know, so it, Do they get polio a lot? No, no. I mean, uh, if you look in my Chapter 5, what the thing in the 1900s, Hygiene was really coming up to, to standards. I mean, people didn't even have many toilets in their house until the 1930s. So as hygiene got stronger and stronger and we had bathrooms and running water and we're taking, you know, cleaning and, and having really good standards, uh, all of those uh, communicative diseases were reducing in the 40s and 50s right when vaccines came in to be popular. So polio was reducing. All these other illnesses were reducing at the same time that the vaccines were coming in and they took credit for reducing polio through the Salk and Sabin vaccine. Mm, I see what you're saying. Mm. Yeah. But it really, so much of it is is good diet and ah, clean sanitation. You can't say more, you know, we just, we, you know, clean, you know, bathrooms and, and uh So I have a quick question. Is it, can you recommend a kind of bath? I often believe that we um, can release karmic uh, vibrations through our skin in the bath, in a bath of uh, Epsom salts or cider vinegar. Can you recommend a good bath that might help with some of that? I think that's great. I think the skin brushing is important. I think I think all of those. I don't have a particular bath, but I think all of those, and especially in regard just to the mental, emotional, we're all so busy nowadays and stressed that it's just so great to just take a break and relax and you know, just feel the release of, of the healing that, the and the appreciation the for, this, <laughs> for these indoor toilets that we have nowadays. <laughs> now, please um, give everyone your, how can they get hold of you and get hold of this amazing book? Oh, well, thank you. Well, you just go to RadicalMedicine.com, mm -hmm. and I'm just coming out with a second edition, which will be available in a few weeks. So uh, Wonderful. Just, this is an amazing book. If I had, uh, yeah, I'd like to give it to everybody I know, actually. Oh, well, thank you, Veronica. Well, I really appreciate it. As a tremendous uh, reference point. So this has been Dr. Louisa Williams, and I've so enjoyed this. I have 52 more questions, but I think we're out of time. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate talking to you. And thank you for being a paradigm shifter. This is Veronica Entwistle saying uh, that was today's treat. Look it up, RadicalMedicine.com, listing the collective rage against, uh, let's see, the feminine rage against depression for all these thousands of years. So I will release you now and say thank you for listening, and thank you so much to Dr. Williams. I sure enjoyed her information. Man, that's a lot to learn. And I recommend her book, Radical Medicine. And we'll talk to you soon. Much love and good night.